Oh, good afternoon, you, you, you know, you, you strong few who have remained in this heat uh, to join us for, you know, some of the last sessions of the day. It's fabulous to have you all here and welcome to those of you uh, who may be watching online. My name is Kerry Pinney. I'm ALT's Chief Operations Officer, but I'm also one of the people that you may meet if you come along to any of our sort of CMALT sessions, um, if you get involved in the CMALT courses that we're doing and various other activities CMALT related, you will either meet myself or my colleague Fiona, who unfortunately couldn't be here today, um, but Fiona also um, supports the CMALT scheme too. What I'm going to do today is a bit of a whistle-stop tour of CMALT. So normally I do these sessions sort of for about an hour and we go into lots of detail about all of the different sections and things but there's no time for that today and I want to make sure you've got an opportunity to ask any questions so I'll give you really a, a sort of whistle-stop tour of what CMOLT is what you have to do to get CMOLT why you might want to get CMOLT you know what the value is um, and also how the actual process itself works so this session is really for anybody who you know is interested in doing CMOLT independently rather than say the session we did yesterday which if you want to watch that back is more about um if you want to do a, a cohort of um, people within your institution, for example, and, and, and a credit in-house. Um, so uh, that was uh, yesterday. We had a session on that, if that's of interest. So, mm, no, no, that's entirely the wrong laptop. That's probably why that didn't work. There we go. So welcome. Thank you for coming. Come on in. Hi, T. Rumini. Come on in. So what I'm going to do today, I'm just going to sort of talk you through some of the basics around CMOLT, talk you through you know, where to find things, you know, the different types of portfolio you might do, how the submission and assessment process works, uh, what you might do after CMOLT if you decide uh, to undertake CMOLT, and then I'm hoping we'll have plenty of time for questions and anything else that you'd like to ask. And I'm joined by Lynn, who is my colleague from Amplifier Fee, but also a recent senior CMOLT uh, holder. You, were you got your accreditation a few weeks ago. Yes. <laughs> yeah. For those online, uh, Lynn was just saying that the ink is still wet on her certificate. She got it, but a few weeks ago, her senior CMOT certificate. So thank you, Lynn. And I may turn to you to share some of your thoughts. So a brief overview of CMOT and the scheme. So first of all, our definition within um, ALT uh, around learning technology is not simply that everything that we do is for people who have the job title learning technologist. We have a very broad definition of what learning technology is, whether you're an academic, a researcher, a student, um, you know, we all interact with learning technologies, you know, throughout our, um, our uh, lives and our careers. Um, and so we have a very broad definition. And so therefore CMOT is open to a very wide range of people. It's not simply here for learning technologists and those people with that strict name. And we know that you know learning technology isn't just about the technology there's all sorts of things that go into it sort of the wider context of policy of uh, theory of research and, and the history of uh, learning technologies as a whole so CMOL is for professionals who are actively involved in learning technology and as i say that's not just people who are learning technologists specifically but also people who use it as part of their teaching, as part of their research, as part of their, um, you know, their working lives as students and, and a very wide and broad range of, of people. And we have three different pathways, so associate, uh, CMALT and senior CMALT. Associate level is really for those who are perhaps early career, maybe have only been working with learning technologies for, say, around three years. CMALT tends to be people who are perhaps mid-career for want of a better phrase who have been working with learning technologies for some time and senior CMOT tends to be uh, you know it's more likely to be those who are leading learning technologies in whatever context they're in whether that be research whether that be within their own institution or more broadly perhaps from a research or you know perhaps you're the you have a you know a peer network that you run or something like that and the senior CMOT end is very much about leadership and the impact of your work so that tends to be people who have perhaps had you know a, a very long or a longer career in in learning technology and they can really demonstrate that impact of their work more broadly we have various um, ways that we, we assess and we have a huge pool of assessors. And as we've said many times during the conference, everything that ALT does is with the support of our members. So the people who assess your portfolios are members themselves. They are your peers and they are people that work within learning technology. We've got documentation and, uh, documentation and guidance and I'll point you towards that at the end. We have two independent reviewers when it comes to the assessment process, two people look at it blindly, 
and then they come together and, and come up with their final uh, outcome. They give joint feedback. So whenever you submit your portfolio and you receive your result, if you get a, a referral, which I did, and it's okay, we get a high number of referrals, they will give you helpful feedback to help you rework your portfolio and then re, uh, resubmit it. Then we'll reassess it if you do um, have to resubmit. Many people pass first time without needing any sort of resubmission or feedback at all. And as I say, we have this community of assessors who not only actually do the assessments and follow the assessment process, but they also contribute to our schemes development. So the session that was on yesterday around the in-house accreditation scheme was full of people who are CMOT holders, people who are running cohorts within their own institutions who have given us huge amounts of feedback and input into how we develop the scheme. So we are going to take lots of their ideas forward. So like everything Alt does, CMOL is very much a member and peer led um, activity. So in order to gain um, CMOL, we have um, some, some basic um, things that you have to meet. So one is to demonstrate reflection. So reflection is a key part of the CMOL process. So thinking about the impact of your work on yourself, on your colleagues, what you've learned, uh, and, and how you have developed. Across four core areas, which I'll talk about shortly, and some subsections, and depending on which pathway will dictate how many core areas and how many subsections you have to do. And then we also have, um, you know, you have to uh, reflect on a sort of specialism in the CMOT and senior CMOT area. So that might be something that's unique to you. It might be a particular area of like specific expertise that you feel that you have. And I always say the specialist area is kind of your time to show off and say, this is what I'm really good at. This is what all my colleagues come to me and ask me about and really show off your practice. We also have core principles and values that underpin CMOLT. And what we look for as assessors when we're reading through your portfolio is are you demonstrating those core areas, uh, um, especially, and then the principles on top and the values of CMOLT. And I'll talk to you about those in a second. And once you get your CMOLT um, accreditation, you will have a certificate, you will have the post nominals, you will have a little badge as well. And you'll also be added to our CMOLT holders list. And obviously you can add that to your CV. Uh, and everything else as well. So these are the sort of core areas and up in the top right corner, you can see the sort of core principles um, and values um, that we hold as part of CMOL. So there are, um, there's the contextual statement, which essentially is for the help of the assessor. So when I come to read someone's portfolio, I need to understand a little bit about you. Where do you work? What's the context of your work? Do you work so you, you might not work directly with students. That's helpful for me to know as I'm reading your portfolio about the context of you. So it's not a marked area. You have operational areas, learning, teaching and assessment, the wider context, communication and working with others and future plans. And depending on which pathway you take, there are different um, core areas and subsections that you need to do. So for uh, associate, it's just this first box here for CMOLT, the second, and then if you do senior CMOLT, you have this additional advanced area as well. And as we read through your portfolio, we're looking for those four core principles and looking for demonstration of those four core principles throughout. How do you communicate and disseminate your work? Yes, go ahead. Do you want us to wait till you? No, go ahead, jump in. Sure. Yeah, of course. Thank you for bringing this Sure. Uh, so, with this then, would you, when you say you pick one area that you're specialist at or that yeah. you're expert in, yeah, to cover this, so that would just be in the so the question was, um, oh. you pick one specialist specialism to yeah. cover, so that would be in the specialist area, right? So you would do that in your specialist area section. In each of these sections, what you would do, so for operational areas, for example, take the first one an understanding of the constraints and benefits of different technologies you would pick an example so let's say i don't know the, the vle okay. and you might talk yeah. yeah yeah or a project and you might say well the vle has these benefits but it also has these constraints and this affects me in this way so what you tend to do and what we see most people do is they try to pick one or two examples for each of these subject sub um, core areas and what you're trying to do in your portfolio is you're trying to address each one so you're demonstrating your knowledge in the areas of learning, teaching and assessment by giving us examples from your practice that demonstrate your understanding of learning, teaching and assessment, yeah. the wider context. So that would be about around legislation so that you could talk about um, 
accessibility legislation and how that impacts your work or any other sort of policies and things like that that uh, are in that affect your work so these are essentially the 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 topics that you talk about and you pull from your experience examples to cover yeah. those and most people would tend to pick a different sort of theme for each of those yeah often it's, it can be quite difficult because sometimes your work could fit in multiple things so the question there was do you pick different examples um for each section so sometimes things overlap so actually something you might talk about here would still be just as relevant here for example what we tend to say is try to have a variety of things because what you're trying to show is the expanse of your knowledge and the expanse of your experience so the more examples you can show the better but often you know you might talk about in depth something in your specialist area that you've referred to in the learning, teaching and assessment section. The key to it is making sure that you're addressing the core area, yeah. the, the topic. That's the key thing to do. So you, you, could, you could pick then something like um, body swaps and VR. Yep. And I'm just thinking off the top of my head now, but, and, and use that for the first two. Yeah. And then choose yeah. something else. Yeah potentially another two yeah because okay. you talk about them differently yeah. and you would you know so you could talk about with it with vr so the question was around using vr and, and other things as an example so you could talk about vr under the wider context and talk about say policy or you know uh, procedure or or you know how accessibility guidance affects the use of vr but you could also refer to it in operational areas and you could talk about say if you were talking about the supporting the deployment of learning technologies you could talk about how you deployed yeah. vr so it's not a case of thinking of it from you know you, you could talk about vr and everything yeah. in essence but you want a bit more variety as much as you can show yeah. so some of the areas are more you know for variety the question was you know a bit more variety but you know, the more you can show, so take, for example, you know, technical knowledge and the ability and the use of, of learning technologies, we would expect to see a range of learning technologies referred to. You know, we would expect to see the breadth and depth of your knowledge. But that doesn't mean to say that if you only talked about one thing in each section, that it would be a fail. It's the detail, it's the richness, and it's the way that you demonstrate the thing that's in, important more than anything. So you, you don't have to pick, but we say try to pick one or two examples. And when we come to the planning, what we suggest you do is take all of the subsections that you need to complete and just start putting ideas down. I could talk about this here. I could talk about that here. I could talk about that here. And then you'll start to see, am I just talking about the same thing all the time or is there a nice variety in it? But what you're really trying to do with your examples is always make sure it addresses the, the core area every time so you will repeat it's inevitable you know we, we all tend to work on specific things but as long as it's really clearly addressing the core area that's the key thing so just talk briefly about the portfolio so any format can be used we get everything from word documents to people who have done it in padlet for example lynn what did you do yours in um, yeah yeah Yeah. So Lynn said that she did Padlet first and then for a second when she applied for senior, she did WordPress. So I did WordPress when I did mine just because it was easy. The main thing to think about with your portfolio is making sure you can still access it when you need to come to uh, update it later. We get all sorts. We get people doing it entirely in videos, for example. Some people just do it entirely in videos. Um, so we get a real variety. Always when you're putting your portfolio together, we have a very vast and varied and diverse, sorry, team, I'll just finish what I'm saying and then I'll come to you. Um, very varied group of assessors. So we do ask that you take accessibility into account and make sure that what you're giving to the assessors is something they'll be able to work with. So do take that into account as well. Team, did you have a question? Sure. question there, sure. Mm. How do you then individually provide the evidence though? Sure. That some of the things are like more screenshots. Sure. Yeah, sure. So Team Women, you just asked about use of video and how you would then show the evidence that you need to give um, as part of the um, assessment process. So some people, when they use video, they will just show the screenshots of the thing in the video. So actually having it, you know, plop, you know, flashing up on screen. Sometimes people do, you know, fun animations and show pointy, you know, pointing at things. Other people just embed the video 
and then put the evidence as files underneath. So that's absolutely fine. And just to explain if you, because I haven't talked about evidence yet. So when you do your section, you do your description. So you talk about the thing that you've done. You reflect on that thing. So you make sure you talk about what you learned, how it's developed you, what you might do differently in the future, what went really well, what didn't. And then you provide evidence. And the evidence is essentially so that we as assessors know that you did the things you said you did. So it could be screenshots. It could be copies of documents. We get, uh, you know, personal information redacted, of course, uh, emails, you know, where people are, are giving feedback, for example, could be student feedback that you've received, could be testimonials from colleagues, could be some people even give us full access to, you know, learning objects that they've made, for example. So when you do your evidence, just make sure it's easy to access. And that's really all you need to worry about. Yes, go ahead. Can I ask about sure. when you're writing something for portfolio, how academic is, is mm -hmm. the expectation to be citing sure. what you said? So Roddy just asked about um, how academic the portfolio needs to be. Because it's a portfolio and it's about your experience, you can write it in that way. And I would say that that's what I did. Is that what you did, Lynn? It was, it was, yes. Um, even though it was tablet and then WordPress, mm. the writing style was probably more indicative of a blog. Yeah. So it kind of been a little bit more formal blog, but still blog style, but then with some references at the foot, maybe yeah. just two or three yeah. for each, yeah. each point. So Lynn, Lynn, for Harvard with 30 no. no. Lynn just said that hers was very blog style and that she did put references in where it was appropriate. And that's what we find. So take, for example, the teaching, learning and assessment section. You might have some theory that you read or, you know, a teaching or method or something that you follow or that you prescribe to or you feel really influences your practice. That might be somewhere where a, you know, uh, a reference to a, a book that you've read or something like that might be, you know, appropriate. Um, but it's certainly not a academic essay. It's very much about your experience. And I see plenty with no references at all, and they still pass. So often it really does depend on what people are writing about. So people who tend to be much more academic or researchers tend to share a lot more references um, to the literature, but you don't have to, because the portfolio is about your experience, but where you feel, you know, this is something that's important to me, it influences my practice, here's a book that's changed my life and the way that I do something, you could reference it and just show that that's something that's important to you or that you find useful, but you don't have to at all. As, as I said earlier as well, there's a lovely checklist so that you make sure you've covered every section before you submit it. Um, we've got lots of guidance um, documentation online. And also just think about what you can do with it afterwards you know if you make it at your institution for example if you then left would you be able to access it again so it's worth thinking about that when you come to your portfolio and as i say we've got a huge yes team with me sure yeah 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 Mm. Uh, sure. If I put the uh, list of pre examination I did not put, I didn't see anyone who was like doing as I do independent work. Mm -hmm. so sure. How do I do that? Yep, sure. So T. Rumini just asked um, about as an independent person how she can keep. Um, you know, uh, without uh, institutional systems and so on, how she can uh, maintain access to her portfolio. So my suggestion is things like WordPress.com, places like that will give you free accounts where you can make a, a very, even Google Sites, so you, you use Google, don't you? You could make it in your personal Google Sites area, keep it locked down with a password, you know, if you prefer not to share it more openly, and then you keep hold of it. Whereas like for me, for example, if I made one on when I did it, 2016, if I'd made one on my university's Mahara, I'd never have had access to it after I left. And also think about those, you know, things that you can actually keep portable. So say Mahara, just as an example, you can export that and to put that into a Mahara instance somewhere else. But as I say, you could even just do a Word document. You know, it doesn't have to be anything fancy at all. You know, it's the quality of the content, not what it looks like or how it functions that's important. So just think about what's the easiest thing for you to maintain 
what's the easiest thing for you to edit? Because you'll go back and you'll read things. You think, oh, I should have put that in there. I'll move that over there. You know, that sort of thing. Think about those sorts of things. But just make sure it's somewhere that you can always get to it. Because after three years, you have to come back and do an update after three years. And you don't want to have lost access and have to start all over again. So things like Google Sites, even I think even Sway might be free. And Padlet certainly is free. You know, pick one of those things that you know you can keep hold and take ownership of the account. And as I say, you know, it's a narrative. You're talking about your work and you are talking about your life. So again, it's not an academic essay. Um, we want to hear your voice. We want to understand what you do, what's important to you, what influences you, you know, what you've learned, and to really see, you know, you show off what you do. So don't feel that you have to stick to that very academic style. I always enjoy the portfolios that feel like I'm hearing the person who's talking to me and I feel like I know them and that always makes them so much more enjoyable to read. As it says here, there isn't a prescribed word count and we have we have had portfolios of like 10,000 words before. So, um, but we tend to suggest about five to 600 words. That should be enough for you to describe succinctly what you've done, enough room to reflect. How did it go? What could I do better? What would I change? You know, what, what impact did that have? And then, as we say, evidence can just be links to things. You know, if you can embed them in the page, you can embed them in the page. If you've got videos you want to embed or other learning activities you want to embed and so on, can just be screenshots, can be testimonials, can be any number of things. We get a real variety. So the first, oops, sorry, I'm too far. So the first thing you do is you describe. So as I say, the description for each section. So what I did when I did mine is I laid it out. Here's the, um, the subsection I'm addressing. Sub subtitle it description, reflection, evidence, because then I knew every time I was writing and doing all of those three key things. So description is just you concisely talking about what you did. So I started a project. It involved these people. This was what we did. And then when you come to your reflection, this is what I learned. This was what went well. This is what didn't go so well. This is the thing I might change next time. If I ever have to do this again, I'll do this differently or I'll do it exactly the same. Here's some feedback, you know, that sort of thing. But what we're interested in, you know, it's, it's quality over quantity. You know, we don't need long, long, long descriptions. But make sure, you know, people, uh, when we talk about our institutions, sometimes we have a shorthand for things, don't we? And we you know, things that we would talk to other people about that work there, but try to always explain enough that if I was a complete, you know, idiot and I have no idea about learning technology, I could still understand enough about what you're trying to tell me. And, the, you know, this can be a difficult thing depending on the style of writing that you're used to, but the reflecting writing is the absolutely most important bit. So the thing that absolutely, um, uh, you know, causes... Uh, resubmissions is reflection or the lack thereof so it's really key and you can just even just use these titles if that helps you what have I learned I learned that this worked really well or I learned that this didn't work really well or I learned that my students really need this and I gave them this so next time I'm going to change that completely or I learned that trying to deploy this technology in this way didn't work and I won't do it again like that if I have to do it again you know, just use, you can use those or you can use a, you know, a more academic reflective cycle like Gibbs or something like that, if that's helpful. When I did mine, I just used Gibbs reflective cycle and I just put the titles of, you know, the, uh, you know, the, the, the cycle. I just wrote a small amount, a couple of lines for each bit. And that was my reflection. And that worked really well because it helped me really focus the reflection. Because one of the things that often happens is people get back into description rather than reflection. And that's, that can often be the case. And then your evidence, as I say, you know, we tend to say, you know, try and stick to, re to recent practice as much as possible. But if you need to refer back to, say, something you've done 10, 20 years ago, that's absolutely fine. But what we want to see there is you showing how that relates to your practice today. So we want to, you know, maybe that project you did 20 years ago still influences you today. And that's still relevant. And, you know, you've, you can use any type of evidence that you can get. As I say, it's just to show us that you did what you said you did. So if you can't access something, say, you know, say you want to talk about something uh, and you, you can't share it more publicly, for example, maybe it's, it's private and you can't share it or you can't access it anymore. It could just be that you get a testimonial from a former colleague that says, yes, Roddy did that piece of work. 
this is how it is, you know, this was how it went down, tick. We know that you did it. You said what you, you know, you said you did. So those are the three key areas, description, evidence, and reflection. And each of those core areas in every subsection needs to see that description, reflection, and evidence. And like I say, the easiest thing to do, lay it all out. If you know, start with a Word document or a Padlet or a Kanban board, whatever works for you with all the subsections and just start putting ideas down, thinking through what you're going to put in each one and then uh, starting to fill them out. And you can easily move things around if you need to. But every subsection and core area needs to have these three elements. So I'm not going to go into each of these because we could talk about each of these all day long. And I could talk to you for another, you know, I, I do a whole day on this. So uh, we won't go into that now. It's too hot for that. Um, but these are the, the sort of the core areas, as I said earlier. And each one, what we do is, you know, core area one, for example, depending on which pathway you take, you may have two or three subsections to write about. And each one has slightly different uh, requirements so you can see there's a handy table on the website that shows you which core areas and then the subsections and which you have to do depending on which pathway you're doing so for each and every one of these so you know for 3a reflection um, description reflection evidence 3b description reflection evidence every time just to say a little bit about the submission process so there's a checklist in the documents as well, just so that you can, before you submit it, just go back through and tick, 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 tick. Yes, I got that right. So use that if you do decide uh, to go for CMOL. You get two, essentially you get two attempts the first time. So if you submit, worst case scenario, you get referral major revisions. What that means is, there's something significant about the portfolio, either every section needs work or something like that, or you've forgotten evidence from every section, something like that. If it's a referral major, that's basically, there's really, there's a lot that needs working on. The majority are referral minor. And that's usually because there might be one or two sections that need some additional work. So the assessors will tell you what they want to see. So when I write my feedback, I always say in section 2A, you know, you haven't reflected enough. You know, there's only two sentences about your reflection. So can you expand on that reflection? Tell me more about what you learned, what you did, how you felt about it, what you learned and so on. Ideally, first time we pass, I didn't. I will tell you that I left mine two weeks before the absolute final deadline that I could hand it in. You get two years from when you register to hand it in. And I left it till the two weeks before. So I got a referral, but thankfully I got very, very good feedback, which helped me. And then the next time I passed. If it's a really exceptional portfolio, they will also award pass with distinction, which is for a really exceptional portfolio. Um, and, and we give those portfolios uh, a distinction. So let's say you get referral minor or referral major, you'll get all of your uh, feedback and then you can act on that and then you can resubmit. And this is the final chance essentially. Pretty much the majority at least pass. But we do actually get some people that really want to get passed with distinction and they do lots of work to get passed with distinction. The absolute worst case scenario is on the second attempt, you fail. And at that point, you have to re-register and start again. What I always say to people is, even if you're not 100% about your portfolio, but you're not sure where to go, you get two chances. So submit it. You'll get useful feedback from the assessors. They will help you to develop it. And then you can resubmit it the next time. You know, I think I, I can, you know, sometimes we can get sort of paralyzed by perfection. If it's got all the elements in there, but you're not quite sure, submit it anyway, and you will uh, get useful feedback. But you may also find you pass because we can be our own worst critics, can't we? We have three uh, submission windows. Uh, so our next submission window is the 30th of September this year. But we also have January and May as well. And as I say, you get two years to submit from when you register. So, uh, you know, Plenty of time to have a go uh, if you want to. I won't go into life after CMOP because it's, uh, I'll just say very briefly, uh, after three years, once you've been accredited, you have to do an update. So it's a minor update that just looks back on the previous three years. What have you been doing? How have you been keeping your practice up? And so on. And it's also something that um, we, uh, it's a, an annual renewal. So each year you you can, you can renew for like three years if, if you want to, but each year you renew 
And then after three years, you have to do a, an explicit update on your portfolio. We also share portfolios as well. So if you're open to it and you're willing to share your portfolio, we, um, we keep it locked to members only, but we share example portfolios. So there's a whole register and list, if you're a member, of portfolios if you want to go and have a look and see what other people have done. And once you've got your CMOT accreditation, that's the point at which you can also become an assessor. So all the people who assess, myself, I, I'm an assessor, and there's lots of assessors here at the conference. We have CMOT, and when we got CMOT, we also then became assessors ourselves. Um, so you can also do the same um, if you choose to, but it's not mandatory, obviously, after you get uh, accreditation. There we go. I will share these slides in, in the Discord, so you can click on all the links to the help stuff, otherwise it's just... You know, just a load of links. Um, so I will share that. I think we are, yeah, bang, just one minute after time. Um, so if you do have another session that you want to go to, please feel free to. But otherwise, I'm very happy just to stay here for a few minutes and answer any questions that you have. Oh, I do. I should do a plug while I'm here. So on the uh, on the 18th of October, if you can bear to spend an hour with me, then uh, I'm doing another getting started with CMOT session, which is a slightly longer version of this, where I go into a bit more detail about the sections and the, the different uh, content requirements. And if you really want a sort of um, a real boost to your portfolio writing, I also do a full day, nine, uh, about 9.30 till 4, accelerator workshop where we essentially, I will go through all of the sections in great detail. You'll have an opportunity to actually be an assessor and learn how to assess so that when you come to writing your own portfolio, you will have that mindset when you come to write your portfolio. And there's also opportunities as well to actually get started with writing your portfolio. So they're all on our website if that's of interest to you. We have lots of CMALT events. Um, but otherwise, um, I hope that was useful. I have some handouts for you here if you want to take those away. Let's talk about the key benefits. Oh, you've got one. Well, you're very good. Um, the talk about sort of the key benefits and why you might want to get CMALT. But one of the things, certainly one of the trends I've seen more recently is lots more job descriptions are starting to look for CMALT as a, um, either as a essential, but very often as a desirable. Um, so it's certainly becoming a lot more prevalent um, as part of the assess, uh, the recruitment process. But if you, yeah. Really want to invert our portfolio, which you know because obviously people organization bound. It's a great show, real. It is. So if you are going into an interview or a promotion or, or something like that, you just want to show people yeah. those skills. And I think you know quite a few sections of that, if you link it to really rich digital evidence, it is almost like, shall we say, I don't know, a movie editor or yeah. something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Putting together a show reel. Yeah. It's, it's literally what you're doing. Yeah. So, Lynn was, um, for those online, Lynn was just saying that, you know, putting the portfolio to, together can actually then become a portfolio that you can use for showing new employers and things like that. So I think that's really great advice, Lynn. And I always find that um, doing a reflective portfolio like this really makes you stop and think about all the things that you have achieved because you trawl back through your back catalogue of things that you have done over the years and you suddenly realise just how much you've achieved over all that time. And it's an opportunity to stop and really properly reflect on your career where, you know, be asking your future plans. Where do you want to go next? Where do you want to learn? You know, what do you want to develop? And I think it's always a really good opportunity to just stop and think about what you want and, you know, what you enjoy about your role. So if you do decide to sign up for CMALT, um, we'd be very delighted and we have, you know, help. Um, available to you if you, you do decide to go down that route um, and if you have any questions after this if something pops in your mind do feel free just to get in contact with us we would be more than happy to help institutions are willing to fund quite often yeah so mine was the institution I was at at the time mine was funded by them yeah yeah so it, it does depend but I think there's a lot more a bit like um what do they call now advanced HE but it used to be called HEA didn't it HEA accreditation I think it's starting to become something that institutions are seeing as a value add to help develop their staff. So quite often they will, you know, and if you can, obviously, if you can, you know, demonstrate the benefits to them and to yourself, then they may be more, you know, more willing to do so. But we do get a lot more, um, you know, institutional cohorts now. We have huge, Oxford has a huge group, for example, of course, they're 
it's Oxford. So, you know, you know, they can afford it. Um, but we actually have quite a lot of large cohorts coming in who work together within their institutions to do CMOL and work together to develop their portfolios and support one another, which is really, really nice. Um, but we also have, you know, once you've registered, you get access to our sort of CMOL uh, email list as well. And, you know, you, you have a whole, you know, you if you tweet or, you know, on social media and you ask a question about CMOL, there's always a good, you know, hundreds of CMOT holders that will come and help you. So there's a quite a, a wide network. And we also map CMOT to other, so we have mapped CMOT to the UK PSF, which is obviously changed now. So we, we need to update our mapping, but we map it also to any other comparable um, accreditation schemes too, to demonstrate how the, the, you know, the principles and the values that we talk about and the core areas that we talk about map to those um, things as well. And I certainly found taking my HEA accreditation application and reworking it for CMOL helped me do my CMOL portfolio because you, you talk about a lot of the same things across those, you know, accreditation schemes.